I have the task of explaining and solving all difference of opinion within the next 15 minutes, insha'Allah ta'ala. First of all, why, why do we want to talk about the subject of difference of opinion? Uh, two basic reasons. One is as Yaqeen Institute is addressing different questions that people have, different doubts and, and sources of confusion, invariably we're going to have to decide what are acceptable answers and what are not acceptable answers because there's going to be lots of different potential ways that people say, oh, you can interpret the text this way or that way. So part of this is already going to be uh, part of the process of selecting reasonable answers and putting them out there. Uh, the second aspect is difference of opinion in and of itself can also be a source of doubt for people. So many people uh, you know, may come up to you and say, you know, there's, why are there so many conflicting answers about a single topic in Islam? Why is it that this scholar says one thing and that scholar says another thing? How do we actually uh, solve that and understand that? First of all, let's start with um, some basic questions about Islam and then work our way up to uh, more complex topics and difference of opinion. So, the basic understanding, you know, if, if somebody thinks about the meaning of Islam itself, right, we know, we all know that it's submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so right from the get-go, when we t look at the concept of Islam, we understand that that means that we're striving as, as believers to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do. We're striving to follow the guidance that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in the Quran and as it was explained by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So right from the outset, we can exclude uh, approaches to Islam that are postmodernist in nature in the sense that uh, they view the, the answer as something that you invent rather than discover. We believe that the Quran is communicating a message to us and the job of, of scholars of Islam is to study, analyze uh, the, the text in order to extract and understand what that message is rather than you know somebody saying well Islam can be whatever you want it to be right because if you make Islam infinitely malleable then Islam can, uh, you know, then a person can, uh, can say that the, the concept of Islam itself becomes meaningless, right? If you can call everything peanut butter, then what is peanut butter, right? It, does, it loses its, its own meaning. So the first question that we often have is why doesn't Islam have a central authority, right? Why don't we have like a, a, a big boss at the top, a CEO, a pope, a president, who just says, okay, no difference of opinion on this, this is the final answer. So the first uh, misconception that we have to clarify is that Islam is not a human institution that has somebody making a decision uh, at the top of the scheme. If we look at Islam instead uh, through the analogy of other academic disciplines, uh, we understand that the correct answer is not based on what one person decides or what one institution decides, but it's based on knowledge and understanding and research from the Quran and, and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when you're talking about mathematics or, or, or medicine or science or physics, any of these other academic fields, you don't say, you know, what, who, is the, who is the guy who gets to decide what the right answer is? The right answer is based on those people who have expertise in the field, conducting their research and then coming to, uh, to, to a conclusion based on that. And, you know, on the, on the issue of why do we even have this, uh, the scholars of Islam point out, it goes back to the origin story of human beings, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam and he favored Adam alayhi salam over the angels with the gift of what? Knowledge, right? So as human beings, we, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us certain things in the sharia that are qat'iyat, right? They are, are definitively established, they're not subject to interpretation. Whereas, whereas there are other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has deliberately left that are subject to interpretation so that scholars can exercise their reason and their intellect in applying the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to the, uh, to the uh, physical world. So here's a picture, everybody look at this picture. And I want you to shout out what you think this picture is showing. Sorry? A brain? Okay. Anyone else? Yes? A chest cavity? Okay. At least we got the, the right body part. So it is the chest. The lungs? Okay, good. So this is, this, the reason why I show this, so this is a CT scan of the chest and this patient has a blood clot in their pulmonary artery in the artery that supplies the lung and this is a, a, a lethal condition. If this patient is not treated, they can die. And anyone who's properly trained can look at this and give you one right answer. This is, this is a qat'i issue for somebody who has the proper knowledge. Um, but 
you know, for an average person, they will look at this and somebody might shout out, this is the brain, this is the leg, this is whatever, because they don't have the familiarity. So things may be crystal clear to somebody with the adequate expertise, but they may not be crystal clear to somebody who has not uh, studied extensively. Whereas there are other things that everybody should be able to, to recognize. So here you can see there's a hand, and it's an x-ray of the hand, and the fingers are missing. But this is something that is, is analogous to ma'lum min al-deen bid-darura. Anyone looking at this image can see something basic like that, right? You can see that there's fingers missing. So there's certain things in the Islamic sciences that everybody should be able to recognize. They're uh, you know, obvious to anyone with basic familiarity uh, with the Islamic teachings. So understanding that, we can answer some of these following questions. So are there different opinions on everything? And the answer is no. Like any academic discipline, there's going to be some things that are fundamentals, that are usul, that, that are not open to interpretation, and there's some things that are furor, um, you know, s subsidiary issues which are subject to interpretation and require expertise in order to, um, to, uh, to come to an answer. And then the question of why didn't God tell us everything explicitly, as we mentioned, because Islam is a deen that favors knowledge and favors the exercise of human reasoning in its understanding and application. Is difference of opinion bad? Um, there's a beautiful narration in which uh, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal was told uh, that somebody had compiled a, a book of differences and they called it Kitab al-Ikhtilaf. And he said, instead you should call it Kitab al-Sira. Right? Instead of calling it the book of differences, you should call it uh, the book of capacity or flexibility. So when we talk about differences of opinion, we can categorize them broadly into two different categories. right? قول معتبر and غير معتبر. So you can talk about valid or invalid differences of opinion. And the valid differences of opinion are going to be determined based on the scriptural strength of support that they have from the Quran and Sunnah according to the, the, the proper methodology, right? So like any academic field, there's going to be a certain differences of opinion that are, are valid, right? As a, as a medical doctor, if a patient has um, you know, an infection, we may disagree on the best course of antibiotics to treat this particular infection. But we may agree that surgery would, would not be an, uh, a reasonable option at all. Whereas somebody outside of the field without the adequate expertise, that might not be obvious to them. So. Um, there's going to be some uh, issues that you know, people, uh, it, it, even though it's categorized as a binary, it's, it's obviously a spectrum. So people are going to tend to agree more on, on some issues, and then as you start m mentioning other issues, it's going to start pushing away from the, the valid, and it's going to kind of go towards you know, weaker and weaker and weaker until it becomes uh, an opinion that pretty much everybody concludes is invalid. So there is going to be a spectrum of a, a opinion in the middle. So what makes an opinion invalid? So differences between uh, valid and invalid opinions, scholars of Islam have classically talked about this, right? So uh, Abu Ishaq al-Shatabi, uh, rahimahullah, who died 790 Hijri, the author of the famous Muwafaqat, who did a lot of uh, discussion on the concept of maqasa sharia, the objectives of, of Islamic law, he talks about how a valid opinion is one in which it's, it, has, um, a, it has been derived from the text of the Quran and the Sunnah using the, the principles of the Arabic language, using a methodology that is familiar to all scholars of Islam called usul al-fiqh, right? Whereas an invalid uh, uh, opinion is one in which a person is using something that is not recognized as an, uh, as an acceptable source of, of law. You know, for example, somebody may say, well, I like this opinion because it agrees with Western liberalism. And so I'm willing to disregard any scriptural proofs to the contrary because I've already concluded that this is, this is the opinion that I'm going to follow. And so that's not going to be a valid methodology. So the corollary of that is that you can have two people say the exact same answer, but one of them is advocating it based on a correct methodology and based on an, uh, a sound understanding of, of, of interpretation of text from the Quran and the Hadith. And the other person is advocating it based on uh, just saying, well, you know what, I want to reject this hadith or I don't want to accept that verse and I want to just go with this because it's more convenient or it agrees with personal desires or it agrees with um, the favorite ideology of the day. So uh, there's many works of, uh, of scholars that have talked about what are the conditions for uh, things to be considered a valid or invalid opinion. And just to look at uh, one example from the work Ikhtilaf al uh five conditions that are mentioned here. Number one, the person who the opinion is coming from. It has to be from a qualified uh, uh, scholar. 
It has to be from somebody with proper credentials. Right? If you want a surgery, if you want an appendectomy, you're not going to go to somebody on the street and tell them, you know, can you grab a, uh, a kitchen knife and, 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 and do your job, right? You're going to go to somebody who's graduated from a sound educational institute, and part of that is also peer recognition, right? Other people in the field who have expertise, they recognize one another, and that's why um, in different disciplines, we often have the formalization of that peer recognition through the form of colleges, right? So in, in, in Canada, we have, for example, the College of Physicians and, uh, and Surgeons of each province that is responsible for saying, oh, you know, if this person, if this physician is doing something um, that is, uh, is not credible, or if they're violating you know, the, the responsibilities of a physician, then we can actually revoke that person's license. So there's that kind of peer recognition that's important as well. Secondly, uh, an opinion that a person is presenting does not contradict the consensus of, of scholars. And we always have to be careful about that one because sometimes there, there may be things that are um, hastily reported as consensus, but on further examination there isn't actually a consensus. And we find that early on there were dissenting views on, on some of those topics. Uh, thirdly, that it does not lack precedent in the tradition. Uh, fourthly, that it does not arise from an unacceptable source, something that is not considered uh, a source of Islamic law. And fifthly, that it does not contradict unequivocal evidence um, from the Quran and Sunnah. So qualified scholarship beyond just the academic qualifications, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal mentions in a beautiful narration that Ibn al-Qayyim comments on in I'lam uh, al-Muwaqi'in. He talks about some of the other uh, aspects of, of somebody who is a qualified scholar, somebody with sincere intention, spiritual integrity, um, independence from others, right, rather than just being uh, you know, it, directly under the influence of a particular organization or group or, or, or a political government where everything they're saying is, is, is just to appease the rulers. Um, fourthly, academic expertise. And fifthly, familiarity with the situation of, of, of the people that they're dealing with. So this is something interesting as well. Um, some of the scholars of, uh, of Islam also mentioned uh, for example, the, the famous Hanafi jurist Ibn Abidin, he mentioned that uh, just as the ignorant physician is barred from practice, uh, so too should the unfit scholar be barred for pra from practice. So they had this, uh, this notion that, you know, uh, as some, some of the scholars said, like a, a, a half scholar is more dangerous than a, a half physician, right? If the, somebody who's unqualified, there should be some uh, restrictions by, uh, by others put in place uh, that prevent them from being a source of, of misguidance. Similarly, uh, the Hanbali scholar Ibn al-Najjar, he mentioned it is the responsibility of the legislative authorities to ban unknown and ignorant uh, scholars from issuing uh, fatawa. And obviously in the digital age, this is not something that, that becomes feasible. So people are exposed to all these conflicting sources of misinformation. So it's important for, for the credible uh, community leaders to, to address that. Because if you, if you can't prevent others from, from being a source of misinformation, then you have to clarify uh, and, and contextualize that misinformation. And some of the scholars, for example, Badr al-Din al has a, a work on usul al-fiqh called uh, Bahr al-Muhit. And in this work, he actually mentions that many of the scholars actually talked about um, the, the having examinations for people before they, they, they give fatawa as well. So just like you know, you have to pass a licensing exam for many different professions. The same concept was mentioned uh, for, for scholars of, of jurisprudence. And uh, one of the examples that they give uh, to substantiate that is that Ali ibn Abi Talib was once walking and he saw Hassan al-Basri uh, 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 sitting and, and, and speaking in his, his halaqa and he actually uh, uh, asked him some questions. And then when he was satisfied with the answers that uh, Imam Hassan al-Basri gave, he mentioned, now you can, you can continue uh, to lecture now as you please. So uh, another uh, fundamental concept is, is an, uh, if you're looking at an opinion, something that any lay person should be able to realize is that there's fundamental values in Islam. Okay? And so uh, somebody comes up with a, a, a new opinion that contradicts those fundamental values, you can easily recognize that this is not some, going to be something Islamic, no matter what kind of contrived interpretation that they use. Um, and so one example that everybody knows is, is the example if, if somebody gives an opinion that uh, is, uh, it contradicts Tawheed, right, for example. And they say, well, you know, there's, there's actually more than one God or uh, whatever, right? And anyone's going to say, well, okay, this clearly contradicts the very basis of, of, uh, of Islamic theology. 
and because it, it does that, anyone is, is able to, to say that's, that's something that goes against what is ma'lum min ad din bil darura, something that is known by necessity to be from the Islamic faith. So similarly, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions in his work, I'lam al muqreen he mentions that the, the sharia, the, the Islamic legal system, is in its entirety justice, compassion, and wisdom, and therefore anything which contradicts that, um, such as cruelty, harm, or, or foolishness, nonsense, can never be claimed to be part of the sharia, no matter what interpretations attempt to do so. So, what about tradition? Do we need to quote scholars from the past in order to, to prove an opinion? Does it matter what the Muslim Ummah for centuries believed? So the logic of tradition is very, uh, very strong. If, if you know, thousands and thousands of scholars throughout the history of the Ummah have been saying that this is the correct answer, and suddenly I come along and I say, well, all of these guys got it wrong, and I'm the first one who came up with the right answer. I have to have a pretty good explanation for why that answer was not obvious to all these people who came before me, right? Uh, so that's, that's the basic logic of, of following the tradition. And um, scholars from all different schools of thought express this. So Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah mentions that any uh, religious opinion from someone later, from, a, uh, from, from someone who came afterwards, that was not arrived at by anyone before that person uh, is considered an error. As Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal said, that beware of speaking on a matter with something that lacks precedent. And same thing was mentioned by the scholars of, of, of the, the four madhahib and uh, Imam Abu al-Hassan al-Ashari mentioned the same thing as well. So it goes across different uh, schools of law and schools of thought. Um, now Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah mentions a very interesting point. He says, it's important to know that an opinion that is rejected because it lacks precedent is one pertaining to an issue that emerged during the early generations which they pass their verdicts on, and then someone comes later with a new opinion. So it's not going to be something that uh, never existed before, or there's new uh, information now that wasn't accessible before. In those situations where there's new information that wasn't accessible before, then obviously somebody is going to have a justification to say, this is where we have to actually revisit this issue. And so, um, there's one, one example that I'll, I'll just mention about this, and this is something, a phenomenon that's known to scholars of Islam. It's called تغير الفتوى بتغير الزمان والمكان. The changing of a legal ruling based on the changing of time and place, based on the changing of circumstances. So uh, Imam al-Sarakhsi, one of the great Hanafi jurists, he mentions that the differences between Imam Abu Hanifa and his companions, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad ibn Hassan Shaybani, that the majority of those differences were not ikhtilaf, hujjatin wa burhan. They were not differences based on their different understandings of proofs and evidences. Walakin ikhtilaf wa asrin wa zaman. But rather they were differences based on the differences in their time period. So if that's the difference you can have between one generation, between Abu Hanifa and his companions, what about differences that happen after the Industrial Revolution, after there's so many different changes in society. So those are the issues that scholars have leeway to investigate further. Um, there's more that can be said, but inshallah we'll get into some of the issues uh, in the Q&A.